hopefully everybody's getting a message on their screen that this is being recorded and you'll be able to accept that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and welcome everybody now. My name is Annie Evans. I'm the Director of Education and Outreach at New American History Project, which is hosted by the University of Richmond. Uh, and we are very excited this evening. Um, this is going to be a very informal conversation and sharing of information and ideas. I hope everyone had an opportunity to see this incredible film. You should have received a link when you registered for this evening's webinar. Um, and I have the pleasure of really being with a group of friends this evening um, and sharing them and their work with you. So I'm going to start by introducing my two co-hosts that are going to help me out tonight. Mary Arad is from VPM, which is our local PBS channel in Richmond and Charlottesville. Mary's located in Richmond. I'm in Charlottesville. And um, she's going to help me out tonight with the Q&A. So if you have questions for our filmmakers, Hannah and Lance, or Rodney, the curriculum developer, um, please put those specific questions in the Q&A. And when we get a little later down the program, we're going to have her give us those questions out of there. She's going to monitor that. In the chat will be my very good friend, Lillian Brown, who is the social studies K-12 specialist for Portsmouth City Schools here in Virginia. Lillian also works with us at New American History on helping to design some of the curriculum um, that is in our learning resources library. And you'll get a link to one of our lessons that relates to tonight's film. Um, and hopefully you'll have time to go back later and visit that library and find other resources that you might use in your classroom if you're a teacher or that you might want to recommend to your teacher if you're a student. Um, and so our guests of honor tonight, however, um, are our filmmakers. Lance Warren and Hannah Ayers, who are in Richmond, as well as Rodney Robinson, who was the 2019 National Teacher of the Year, but in my mind, he's always the Teacher of the Year and a good friend. And Rodney developed beautiful learning resources to go with the film to help bring the film alive in your classroom. So um, I'm gonna start off just very briefly. I'm gonna share my screen and I'm going to show you some resources that we put together for, um, for the film and also for people in general who are sharing, um, talking about monuments and memorialization or talking about contested landscapes if you're teaching AP. Um, hopefully you guys can now see my screen. Can someone confirm for me that that's what you see? Okay, great. So this is a, a landing page. If you're a, a long-time user of some of our content, you're used to coming to the, our website and finding inquiry-based learning resources using something that we call the 5Es model, where we give you basically five days worth of um, ex learning experiences and activities that you can use in your classroom. Or if you're a student, your teacher shows you a different view that would be ready for students to use. But tonight, we just created this page because there's a lot of great resources. There's been some wonderful interviews already done prior to this evening. And we just thought um, busy teachers don't have time to run around the internet looking for all those materials. So we thought it would be helpful um, to collect some of those for you. And we will continue to add and change this as um, you know we find other great resources that relate to this. But um, I'm just gonna qu quickly scroll down through this page so you know, and you're gonna get a link to this and everything else that we show you tonight. Lillian's gonna put great links for you in the chat. Um, so this is um, a link to the screening version. You already got a copy of that. You were able to hopefully view the film, but if not, we also put a copy of how you can get to the film uh, if you wanna share it with your class. Um, the VPM page, which I will show you in a moment in more detail is on here, as well as the PBS learning media page that we're gonna take a peek into. Uh, I included a link, the Smithsonian Channel showed the film, I think it was back in August, and uh, they did a great panel discussion. Uh, and so I thought you might wanna see um, a different you know, version of a panel discussion with uh, Hannah and Lance were there, along with some other folks who were in the film that are not on our panel tonight. I think Christy Coleman might've been in that one and um, Michael Paul Williams and some others. There was also a great NPR interview done just prior to the film premiering um, at an outdoor venue, Maymont here in Richmond over the summer. And if you are a Virginia educator, the Go Open platform has open educational resources. If you create a free account, you can also go in and find many of the resources related to the film through Go Open. 
Uh, I'm going to share with you uh, an exhibit called Monument Wars that's on one of our uh, resource pages, which is Bunk. If you're not a fan of Bunk history, hopefully you will be after tonight. Um, and then a learning resource that we developed that talks about monuments and history in public spaces that talks about Monument Avenue and how other monuments are being interpreted and discussions in local communities around monuments, when they were put up, why they were put up, should they stay up. Um, and this is a more general lesson. It's not specific to Richmond, like the film and the resources that Rodney will share. And then the final resource is um, explained today, which is a medium post that our executive Executive Director Ed Ayers wrote last summer um, when the Black Lives Matter protest and the protest to take down the Confederate monuments in the summer of 2020 um, were happening in real time. And many teachers have downloaded this particular Medium post. It's probably our, in our top two uh, most downloaded posts. So a lot of teachers ask, you know, they, they use that in class. So this is the VPM page. Um, and they do have the screening version up on there. And then one of the great things about it is they give you all the other resources. Many of them plus others are here. On Monument Avenue is a website that um, is hosted on the American Civil War Museums page that talks about some conversations that went on here in Richmond over the years on this exact topic. Uh, the real Richmond history is the local uh, Richmond City Public Schools curriculum. Our website, New American History, is linked, as well as Jackson Ward Project, which is a wonderful project that we are also involved in um, working uh, people from Jackson Ward, which was the historically African-American neighborhood where Maggie Walker um, lived. And it's now um, the subject of a wonderful local history project by two wonderful sisters, Anjali and Cisha Moon. Um, if you have not checked out that project, it's amazing. PBS Learning Media, if you're a teacher, you know that PBS Learning Media allows you to plop these resources right into your Google Classroom, so that's very convenient. And then our curriculum guide that our own friend Rodney Robinson created is amazing, and he's going to share that with you. So um, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to show you a couple of our specific resources. Um, Monument Wars uh, is um, a bunk exhibit. So bunk is a real-time curation of media, whether it be newspapers, audio, video content. And sometimes we put those into what we like to call exhibits. Uh, and so we just take collections that we think teachers would want to share with their students. Um, and so this is uh, not just talking specifically about Confederate monuments, um, but there are also other monuments like the Columbus, uh, the debate about whether Christopher Columbus monument should come down. Um, and so when you get into bunk, you'll see copies of excerpts or sometimes it's an audio video clip. And then they also show you other related content so students can make connections. Um, there's lots of how-to videos on our YouTube channel. If you want to know more about Bunk, or you can reach out later and I can um, share Bunk with you or your students if you're a teacher. We also have Rodney's curriculum, which he's going to spend a good bit of time this evening sharing, and a new learning resource that we created on Confederate monuments and history in public spaces. And as I said before, this is not just uh, talking about the Monument Avenue, which was the subject of tonight's film, but it talks about monuments in general and um, different discussions over different periods of time, where different monuments across the country. So it gives you a little bit of a bigger picture outside of Richmond that might be a nice follow up after you've used Rodney's uh, learning resources. So we wanted to make sure that folks were aware of that. I mentioned the blog post. So all of these links are gonna be on a landing page. Um, and if Lillian hasn't already put it in the chat, she will. At the end of the evening, we have a short survey. So I'm gonna go ahead and move over to the curriculum. Uh, you will get a copy of this as well. Lillian will put it in the chat. You're gonna have it on the resources page. Um, but I'm gonna let, I'm gonna turn my microphone off now. I'm gonna let Rodney, um, do a little bit of bringing this to life. So Rodney, you can just tell me when you want me to um, advance the slot, you know, the, the PDF and I'll just scroll down, just let me know. I think you're still on mute, Rodney.
All right, here we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, thank you. I just want to thank um, Lance and Hannah for just the opportunity. You know, this was truly, truly, you know, a labor of love. You know, as, you know, National Teacher of the Year kind of snatched me out of the classroom and sent me around the country like I was Miss America. But, you know, one of my favorite things to do as an educator was just curriculum work. So when, you know, I was approached for the, with the opportunity, it was just something I jumped on. I was just ready to do because I love curriculum. I mean, it's literally one of my passions, just sitting down, work, writing out curriculum and working, you know, different things that I think will work for students and for other teachers. And so I was presented with this um, opportunity and really my whole thing as an educator is what, are the people saying who lived the time? What are the documents saying? That is really my major focus as a history teacher. And so my whole thought with this doc, with the documentary was number one, I don't know how many teachers has had the ability to show a whole uh, film in their classroom. Personally, that is not something I have time to do. You know, I would have, I, I would have to, I would have um, after school clubs. Well, I would show a clip during the class and then allow the kids to come after school and we'd have popcorn and talk and watch the movies. But I just decided I was going to break the film up into small chunks for you, for you process. You can scroll down. And so that's the first thing is table of contents. It's just, it's broken down into small chunks. And being, of course, being from Virginia, I put each SOL objective that could go with each section. And so I gave each section the title, and then with each section, I decided I'm going to find a document that fits this little section, you know, because I always want students to have more context. And as a teacher, the last thing I want to do if someone gives me a film, it gives is give me a curriculum guide with a bunch of questions, answers, just the same old boring worksheets that come along from most companies. Thank goodness we've gotten away from that as history teachers. But I wanted to put the tools and the resources in teachers' hands so that you could create whatever activities you wanted with your students so that you could take it whichever way you do. I really think as a what, what filmographers and what we need to do is put the resources in the hands of the experts and the experts are the teachers. And so I'm gonna put the resources in your hands. So for each section I gave um, a primary source, and then also I gave um, graphic organizers. Um, I think you gotta scroll all the way to the end to get to those. I just wanna get a rationalization for my graphic organizers. And so you have all of these sources. Keep scrolling, keep scrolling, just keep scrolling, keep scrolling. All right, graphic organizers, all right, there we go. And so what I did, first of all, I know that kids on the elementary level are going to think different than kids in the high school level. And so I created graphic organizers for elementary and graphic organizers for secondary. And what these are, this is based loosely off the Library of Congress graphic organizers, but you know, I change and add a little more. But it's so that students can analyze any source. You know, it's called so subject, occasion, audience purpose and the speaker. It's just really a whole way of breaking it, breaking down a document slowly but surely. Subject, what is the document about? You know, then you have to put it in the context, the occasion and who the audience was for the, the document was created for. Then what's the purpose of that document being created? And then lastly, which I think is one of the most important things is the speaker. Who created the document? What was their major motivation? What, what, what were they thinking? What were they trying? To comprehend. And so this is something I use in my class all the time. And so my whole goal is like to have this graphic organizer so that usually halfway through the year, the kids don't even need the graphic organizer anymore. They automatically have it in their head when they're looking at a document and they can work through it in their head brain. Now, of course, a lot of students still need to write it down and take notes. Like me, I still need to write down, take notes and keep it organized. But it's just a good way of analyzing a document, a primary source. All right, and so <coughs> scroll down. 
map analysis worksheet. This is one to use for maps. What type of map is it? You know, what are some of the physical characteristics of the map? Who created the map? You know, just all puts the within the context so that the reader can organize it. So if you watch the clip of the film, then you take the map, and then that gives the film more context. It allows the students to think a little bit more about what they just saw and what they're analyzing. So there's a map analysis worksheet, scroll down. And then there's the image analysis questions. You know, one thing I love, you know, a couple of years ago, I went to Yale University and I took a seminar as part of the Teachers Institute called Using Images to Analyze History. And so using art to analyze history, that was really what it was all about, but art, but I'm like, I'm a historian. I'm gonna use images to analyze history. And so I came up with this thing called, um, I called it PAPSI, people, actions, places, subject, and you know, just so that what are the questions a student should ask when they look at pictures? And then there are different levels. These are the primary, elementary. These are questions that they should ask. Then there's secondary, and then there's the advanced, advanced placement. And so as students analyze pictures, they're asking themselves these questions. And when they put the answers to these questions, it allows them to better analyze the, the work of art or the actual picture that's going on. And so it's a really, really good way. So scroll down a little bit. All right. So you got your sources, image analysis, then it takes it to another level, interpretation, evaluation. You notice this is slowly climbing up Bloom's taxonomy of learning. And so by the end, they're able to make a value judgment and not only can they make a judgment based on the image, but they now, if they've answered the questions, they can go through and prove, this is why I can, I can make this statement about this picture. So it's not just the kid looking at the picture and saying, oh, I think this is, a, this is a bad representation. If they've answered the questions, they now can, if need be, write out a defense. This is why I think this is a bad representation. And so it's really just a really good way of helping students, one, organize their thoughts, but two, be able to explain how they concluded their opinion. And so it's just a really, really great way. And so I really, really like doing this. I really think it's important for students to be able to look at a picture and not just say it's good or bad, but also to give it context, to give it to, well, I think the people in this are doing this or, if you look at the way this guy's positioned, I would say it's really a way of allowing students to use the skill that they naturally had. And that's that observation. You know, one thing about my kids and anybody who works with kids, they are very observant. You know, any teacher who's ever cut their hair or wore different sneakers, your students notice that immediately. Well, why not use those skills in the classroom? Look at pictures, analyze historical sources and have them form their own opinion. And then if you scroll back up a little bit. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going to the RAF portion. All right. Thanks. So I decided to put some project-based learning activities. And one of the favorite things I love is the RAF. And the RAF is basically what it, the RAF does, it gives students choice. You know, the student who's very artistic, they can use those skills to analyze, um, you know, their work. Student who's very poetic, they can write a poem. The student who likes to write just in general, they can write an editorial. It really taps into all the skills that the students have rather than just saying, write me a paper analyzing you know, the monuments, I can say, okay, pretend you're a person, write an editorial to a newspaper, or pretend you're an artist and draw me a political cartoon. And so it really, it, I like it because it has student choice. So you give them a role, what is the role of the student, the audience, who are they addressing the uh, project to, what is the format, and then give them a topic. You know, and then one thing I love about this, sometimes when I give my students the assignments, I would leave and have a blank space. 
and like a student could say, hey, I want to express what I feel about the document, you know, about this picture by drawing my own picture. And so, hey, student choice. But it really, I often say it's like driving a car, you know? You know, you're, you're like, I'm the driver's ed instructor. My students are driving the car, but I'm that driver's ed instructor with my foot on the brake for when they go a little too fast so if they get out of line. But it's also, but it allows the students to take full control of their learning. And so if you scroll down, and so if you read through it, there are a couple of suggested activities they can do. And then of course, I put in a, keep going. I put in a gallery walk activity. That's where you just put pictures up around the classroom and you can have students go around and write questions, make observations. And you know, one thing I like to do is give them post-it pad, one for an observation, one for a question, and one is a statement you wanna make about the picture. And as they go around the class, they put those, those up. And then at the end, as a class, you have a discussion about everyone's statements, observations. It's really, allows all students to participate. Now, it could be something minuscule, but that student got a chance to participate. It really encourages student activity. Um, when I worked in, honestly, when I worked in the juvenile detention center, one thing we couldn't do was we couldn't allow the students to get up and move around the class. And so I would do time. Every I get the student a picture, you have 20 seconds to write a much, as much about the picture as you can, then pass it to the next student. You know, and everybody will put their own thing. Then at the end, I put the image up in front of everybody and we could talk about it and analyze it. That's more where you can adjust that activity, gallery walk. And then of course, the last thing, if you scroll down, document-based questions. You know, if you teach AP, if you understand AP, you gotta have those DBQs in it. But the great thing about these DBQs is if you've done all of the graphic organizer activities, writing these DBQs are cinch. You know, because you know how to analyze the picture. You know how to analyze the document. You can actually use those graphic organizers to help you organize your document-based questions. And so the whole purpose of this is scaffolding. You know, giving kids skills on this level, and then by the end of it, they should be able to use those skills to produce a big product, which is a document-based question or essay that shows. And so I'm a firm believer in, you know, we all know kids come to us. We have some kids who are up here, there's some kids who are down here. And so what we want to do is have an activities where the kid who's up here can go up here and the kid who's down here can come up. And so that's really what this entire curriculum unit was. It was about number one, putting the resources in the hands of teachers and allowing them to make the decisions that work best for their students. And number two, giving students graphic organizers that allow them to scaffold and build up knowledge as they answer the questions. And so I feel I'm very proud of this work because you know this was a labor of love, but it's really something that all learners can use. Thank you so much, Rodney. I have been digging through these resources um, since you first shared them with the American Civil War Museum Summer Teacher Institute. We got, we got a little preview before they went live on the VPM site. So um, for the teachers who are with us this evening, um, I, I believe Lillian put it in there as both a PDF and as a link. Um, and I just can't tell you how much uh, I enjoyed going through the resources. I taught in Richmond for over 20 years and lived on Monument Avenue. And I learned so much both from the film. I told Hannah and Lance that I've seen the film, I think nine times now. Um, but going through your resources, even though I taught in Richmond, I taught about this time period and I taught about the monuments and I taught about Monument Avenue. Um, I learned things that you teased out and pulled out. And I know that the teachers and the students who are with us tonight will learn so much. And I do encourage you to watch that. I know hopefully you watched the film before you joined us tonight. I had a couple of students that we've been working with text me and say, if I don't have time to watch the film, can I still come? And I said, absolutely. Um, and, and then you can watch it tomorrow or you can watch it this weekend or over winter break. But um, every time I watch it, I see something different. And then I go back to Rodney's learning resources because I wanna see you know, what did he think of that or how did he approach it? So we are just, 
over the moon excited to get these resources in the hands of more teachers um, and teachers outside of Virginia. That's what I'm most excited about tonight because I think we've mainly had a Virginia audience for uh, the learning resources, but tonight I'm hoping that more um, of our friends across our large network of teachers, I know we've got folks from California in here tonight and Iowa and Vermont um, and Wisconsin. And so we are just really excited along with our Virginia teachers. Um, so, we're going to yeah. start opening things up to questions. Mary is monitoring the Q&A. So if you have specific questions for Rodney, if you'll kind of indicate this is a Rodney question, or if you have questions more about the filmmaking side of things, um, Hannah and Lance are here. I know we have a few friends tuning in from National History Day, students who are working on their projects. So if you want some insider tips on filmmaking that, you know, Hannah and Lance have done a, a whole video uh, for us. Uh, and that's on our YouTube channel. They did a whole evening of uh, National History Day questions for us last year. So I'm going to go ahead and open it up to questions. Mary, are there some already in the Q&A that you want to give us the first one? Nothing in Q&A yet. Okay, great. I've got some that were submitted ahead of time to me or that I had. So um, I'm going to start with Hannah and Lance. Um, just what what was your reason for making this film in this moment? Tell us a little bit about how this film came about. Sure, sure. Well, first of all, thank you for, for having us. Um, it's a real treat to connect with teachers. Um, and we've been very fortunate to work with Annie at New American History and work with Rodney and um, previously worked with um, Learning for Justice, previously known as uh, Teaching Tolerance on making learning materials for our films. And it feels, critical to us to to have um, those resources hand in hand with the film because you know on its own a film can only do so much and we really want to make films that can be tools in the classroom and um, we're we're not teachers we know where our uh, talents stop and and we admire teachers so much so um, yeah this is this is very special um, so this film came about Lance and I have been making um, media at the intersection of history and social justice for about 10 years. And we were living three blocks away from Monument Avenue um, last summer. And when we saw the protests right on our doorstep, we realized this was a really urgent moment and that more people were paying attention to um, not only the, the current situation, but also the, the undercurrents of, of why this was happening. Um, we were looking for a way to contribute to the conversation and thought, well, a historical perspective could be really useful right now. Um, and we were really moved by the, the size and scale of the protests and wanted to really recognize how that was part of a continuum of resistance to um, not only the monuments, the physical statues, but all symbols of white supremacy um, in Richmond. And um, so we decided to kind of dig in. We, we approached VPM um, very early on in June, and we're fortunate that they um, signed on very quickly and said, yes, this sounds like a good idea. We hit the ground running and, um, and quickly realized that, you know, if we're going to tell this story, it's really telling the history of Richmond um, since emancipation. And, um, you know, we, we use the lens of the statues to tell the history, but um, because that story had never been told in that format, we kind of embraced the opportunity to say, okay, let's dig in and let's, um, let's really lay the groundwork for, for what's happening all around us. Yeah, and just to highlight one thing that Hannah said, I mean, th this film, I think it's important to, to recognize, is not a film about Richmond's Monument Avenue. It's not even a film about Confederate monuments more broadly. It's a film about 160 years of Black resistance to white supremacy in the former capital of the Confederacy. But it's a, it's a story that has its own echoes and symmetries in cities across this country. Um, that story, that bigger, longer, deeper story allows us to see that the Confederate monuments are just one of many, many forms of white supremacy. It's a reflection of white supremacy. So the resistance to the monuments in 2020, as the people who were fighting on the front lines will tell you, it was never just about those monuments in the first place. The problem wasn't the statues. The problem was, and the problems remain far deeper and more pervasive. And so they have always been. 
Uh, and what we wanted to, to demonstrate was that just as people who were on the front lines in 2020 fighting understood that, had demands that went well beyond uh, the, the removal of Confederate iconography, so it was the case for decades and generations prior that Black Richmonders and other people of conscience who allied with them were determined to remake the city in a way that all people uh, would be welcome here, that a city that has a profound Black history would have a profound Black future. Um, that is a story that has generally not been told because it's reflected poorly in uh, monuments celebrating Confederates. Um, and that was a story that, that indeed, as Hannah said, in, in the moment when suddenly way more people than usual were standing up and saying, oh, yes, Black lives matter, Black history matters. We didn't know how long they would say that. And I think anyone who has um, looked and, and observed and taken part in everything that has come to pass in the last 18 months would, would agree. Uh, a lot fewer people seem concerned about that now than, than did last summer. Um, and this, the effort to make the film was, was in part an effort to, to seize something of that moment and, and create something lasting. Um, and it, it's one reason, just to, to emphasize one more thing that Hannah said, what we reached out to Rodney Robinson over the summer uh, when we were first getting into it, because we know so well that the only way a documentary film, any piece of media actually makes a difference is if it's taken into the hands of skilled teachers like Rodney, like yourselves, who can actually put it to work. Uh, and so that was a primary goal from the start. Absolutely. And that kind of leads me to my question for Rodney. Um, did you approach this curriculum project differently than other projects that you've done the past for your own classroom in Richmond? I mean, because of what, you know, the, the scope of this and, and you're in Richmond as well. So you were kind of in the heart of those protests going on in real time. Um, so did you approach this particular curriculum project differently given um, that we wanted to make sure that the film was a way to keep that conversation going, that it wasn't just a short term, many people, many voices. And then as Lance said, there aren't as many people now who are seem to be as actively pursuing it. And we wanna make sure that that's not the case, right? So how, how did that impact the way that you approach the curriculum project? Well, one thing I loved about the, the film itself was just the use of the primary sources. You know, and you know, people might criticize me, but I'm about to say something little like the movie 13th. All right, I'm gonna give you two movies. 13th and um Douglas Blackman's um oh my gosh, it's slipping my hand. Slavery by another name. Slavery by another name, yes. Two documents that cover the same topic. 13th was extremely entertaining and a great piece of work, but it was just people talking, you know, about the sources. You know, slavery by another name had primary sources, letters by the by the convicts in the convict leasing system, government documents. And so to me as an educator, I felt that was a much, much better film because it gave you primary sources that as a teacher, you could go look up and pull up and start to analyze your students. And so when I saw this film, I was like, this is a great historical document, a historical source. And so what I want to do is I want to add more context to the stories, to the different sources. You know, you mentioned the document. I'm trying to put this document in the hands of students. And so you're not just watching the historian, you know, make their opinion of a document. You yourself can analyze the document. And one day you might be the historian on film talking about this document. And so that was the entire goal as I looked at it was to take this film and match the resources with the film so that teachers and students could say, okay, that's why they did this in the film, but let me analyze the source, which gives it even more context and allows me as a student to form an even deeper understanding of it. And so that was the way I approached it. And it was just like I said, it was a labor of love. And I think that that was one of the parts when you first shared these curriculum resources with us this summer that I, I was so excited and I know that the other teachers in the workshop, the way that you paired each segment by chunking the film into the segments, like you said, we don't usually have time to show the whole film, or you may want to kind of revisit the film throughout the year because it really, yeah. as Hannah said, it spans, you know, decades of um, resistance and um, it tells so many stories and you can break that apart 
and, and just do pieces all throughout the year. So I was really excited when you showed us how you paired the documents and then the learning activities. And I really loved the way that you made it so accessible because you scaffolded it for different, not just ages, but also, you know, I've had a couple of teachers say, I know that Rodney put this part in elementary, but my middle school student, you know, has only been here for a few months. He's still learning English. So I'm letting him do this piece of it while these kids over here are doing that. And then my third period is an AP class. So they're doing this part. And so by having all those different, um, activities, but also scaffolding them for all different types of learners, I think makes it such a, a rich resource. And so okay. I know that folks that are seeing it for the first time tonight, you're going to be down that rabbit hole. I just ruined your whole weekend because that's all you're going to want to do is go back and watch the movie, look at the segments, look at Rodney's resources, but that's what makes them so, so tremendous and, and helpful. Um, okay. Mary, are there other questions? Oh, Rodney. Can I just want to add, and the thing with the graphic organizers is you can use them with whatever source, whatever topic you're discussing in your classroom right now. That's the great thing about these graphic organizers. And so let's say, you know, I'm just picking out thing, the crusade for voters, how that was formed. You could find a document talking about the struggle for voting rights in your city and still apply the same graphic organizers to those documents. And so the graphic organizers are universal. You can apply them to anything, anything in your city. You can find another resource from the film that, that you like and you can just make it work. And that was the entire purpose was to put the work in the hands of the professionals. And to me, the professionals are the teachers. Absolutely. Mary, do you have any questions? Yes, um, from David Oglesby. Uh, he's asked a question to Lance and Hannah. What was the process for Hannah and Lance in making the film? How long in pre-production, production, and post? Sure. Uh, thank you, David, for that. Uh, so we we started filming in the middle of June 2020, and we did the majority of the filming between the middle of June and the middle of August. Uh, we did some additional filming in uh, late September and early October. Um, the, after that, we were really principally editing uh, full time from the middle of October through uh, the middle of January, is my memory. And from about the middle of January until early May is when post-production was happening. And, and what that means in the case of our film is all of the images that you see in the film, for those of you who've watched it, um, they all have a sort of three-dimensional effect. Uh, and that's achieved uh, through a couple of motion graphics artists whom we collaborated with who um, by hand treated every single one of the 300 images that appear there. So for four months, they worked at that uh, to create the, uh, the images in, in the way that you see them uh, or to, to render the images in the way that you see them. That's also, we did things like color grading, all the interviews and audio editing. And um, we worked with a composer to uh, create an original score and arranged other music. All of that happened in a four month period from um, uh, January to May. Um, and then from May till uh, late June when we premiered, it was basically working on, on preparing that, that big premiere event and, and rolling out. And I'll add that we felt a sense of urgency with producing this film. So we we really hit the ground running and, and wanted to go through all steps of that process um, as swiftly as we could while, while still, you know, delivering on the vision that we had. Um, and it was because of the sense that people are really paying attention right now. Um, wouldn't it be powerful for this film to come out um, at the anniversary of the summer's uprisings and you know, maybe we could grab people's attention again and, and kind of help ask the question, what did that all mean? And what do we still need to do to realize these hopes and, and visions for the future? Um, so, you know, a lot of pre-production and production were happening at the same time. We were doing tons of research and reading. Um, and, you know, every time we'd interview someone that would open up new questions and, and new ideas for other people to interview. Um, we interviewed over 30 people and, um, unfortunately knew a lot of those folks from previous projects who so were able to draw from um, existing relationships and of course we, we also met new folks who we hadn't had a chance to, to intersect with but um, yeah a lot of archival research was happening this pretty much the entire time as we kept adding layers and um, and 
um, yeah, making sure that the, the primary sources really um, revealed what this history looked like. And I know that we have students working on National History Day projects now. And so I think just hearing all those different steps, you know, as a student filmmaker, they're starting their first steps. You know, they're probably not gonna have a professional composer or, you know, a sound editor, but, you know, your work gives them something to look up to and aspire to. Um, and I know that uh, some of the students that were with us when you did the, the evening for us last year, uh, I was a judge, Rodney, I don't know if you helped judge the um, Richmond local history fair that, that I know your school division has, but I saw um, some giant bumps last year in the quality of the student films. And so if you, you know, it's not too late if you're a student and you don't know about National History Day, email me, I'll get you the hookup or I'll get your teacher the hookup. Um, it's, a great pro it's a great project. To me, it's the best project-based learning that there is out there. So I can't say enough good things about National History Day. Um, Mary, are there other questions waiting in the queue? Yes, uh, so Martina um, and Lance and Hannah, sort of answered part of Martina's question. She asked, how long did it take Hannah and Lance to research and compile data for the documentary? And if it wasn't Hannah and Lance who compiled the research, who did you outsource it to? So we, we did lead the research effort there. Uh, we did collaborate with uh, another person, uh, his name is Charlotte Jurgens, uh, who was really central to the effort. She was our archival producer. And what that means is that when we would say be working on a, a, a part of an interview and somebody would mention uh, a particular moment in the history of the crusade for voters or maybe something involving uh, the streetcar boycott of 1902, we would think about the type of images that we, it, you know, in, in our imaginations thought would really best fit in that part to, to evoke what we were hearing about from the interviewees. And then we would ask Charlotte, who is both a filmmaker and a trained historian to scour the archives, as many archives as needed to find those images um, if they existed. And um, she ultimately worked with more than 50 archives uh, to compile about a thousand images, uh, 300 of which are in the film. Um, and we had a very complicated Google spreadsheet to keep track of all that. And, um, and so Charlotte was a key partner uh, in that just because, you know, the scale of the effort uh, was, was pretty substantial. Um, but yeah, Hannah and I led that effort, uh, imagining what, what sources we would need and, uh, and uh, working with her to, to go track them down. And, I bet there's uh, a lot of teachers that would want to have a copy of that spreadsheet. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, and one thing with that is that the entire film as a result is um, is footnoted. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it was fact checked and footnoted. And so there, there's a version of, a, of the script that's, you know, like 100 pages long that is, <laughs> that is basically, you know, tying everything to um, to something in, um, you know, a, a provable source. And Hannah, I didn't mean to cut you off earlier. Oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. Um, I was just going to say that we also had um, four story advisors who were critical in helping us figure out what to include in the film, what not to, who we should talk to, kind of how to weave it all together. Um, so they played really important roles um, very early on in the process. They were some of the first calls that we had and then also reviewing cuts along the way and giving us feedback about, you know, you're really missing this thing or you need to emphasize this thing. Um, so there were in total 40 people involved in some way in, in making the film. So we certainly had um, much needed support in a lot of those areas. When looking at so many different generations that this story spans, um, did anybody's message or in those conversations you said you talked to some people what surprised you the most were there any interviews that you conducted as part of the film that you something really surprising happened gosh it's hard to narrow it down I think. yeah there are a lot of a lot of moments i think um i spoke to um, a woman named Carmen Foster for many hours um, before the interview, her, you know, sitting down for um, the filmed interview because her family has been here for many generations. Um, and she, and she, you know, also worked in some of the early um, mayoral administrations and had all of this firsthand knowledge of really how Richmond has evolved over her lifetime and also the stories that were passed down from her dad, who was a dentist and community historian. Um, 
And I think one one element of Richmond's history that I just find fascinating is um, the the um, the lawsuit that was put forth um, by Curtis Holt. Curtis Holt, thank you. Um, who was um, an activist, a community organizer in the seventies. And he, as you all may have seen in the film, um, you know, had the gall to sue um, the, the city to say that it was unfair how the uh, voting blocks worked and, um, and the fact that they had just annexed a bunch of Chesterfield County to, um, to loot the power of the black vote. And, um, and as a result of, of his uh, action, the city was just on hold for its elections for seven years. And, um, and his, that lawsuit explains why the city's electoral system looks the way it does today. Um, and I think that was one story that just really um, helped me to see that you know, here's yet another example of individuals uh, standing up for what they believe in and um, it, you know, why we have the district system now is, is totally tied to, to that person's actions. I, I think an interview uh, that sticks out for me and, and calling it an interview is, is kind of too small because his role in the film was so big and that's uh, that of Joseph Rogers, who's a story advisor. So he's one, one of those core four people whom we worked with. And of course, if you've seen the film, Joseph is, is represented uh, quite a lot. He's the guy in the, the purple blazer and the tie. And Joseph's story, um, in, in short, is, is a staggering and a stunning one, which is that he is descended from a man named uh, James Apostle Fields, who was born enslaved and escaped slavery twice, uh, ultimately reuniting with his family at Fort Monroe, also known as Freedom's Fortress here in Virginia, and went on after that to uh, go to school, go to college, go to law school. Uh, he, among other things in his life, uh, earns election to the House of Delegates, um, and he is one of the last people still in office as the uh, fall of Reconstruction and the rise of Jim Crow in Virginia is making it impossible for Black Virginians to hold public office. Um, Joseph Rogers, the contemporary person, knows this history well and has really, in many ways, committed his life to making that history clear, but not simply as a sort of genealogical project. Uh, Joseph is a, a community organizer. He's a public historian um, re, uh, until very recently at the American Civil War Museum um, and, and uh, soon, to be, soon to be elsewhere. And, and I don't know if that's public yet. So uh, it is, it's, it's out there. <laughs> that's great. So, so he'll now it's be- Virginia the, Museum in, of History and Culture. History and culture, culture um, <laughs> which, which is, is wonderful. And, and the, the point I'm making with that is that this is this is a, a commitment uh, to to educate and to engage people in a history that indeed is very personal to him. It, it couldn't be more personal, and that it's the history of his family. But Joseph knows well that it is also the history and the reality of so many families, uh, Black Virginians, Black Americans, um, and he's he's trying to continue to make that real and alive and, and, and for people today. And, and I think the way that Joseph evokes that history and connects it so deftly to the present and to urgent needs that, that have to be addressed now um, is really special and, and not something you, you see in, in most films. He, he's not the sort of person you're going to meet most days. Yeah. And you touched on two things that um, the, the part about annexing Chesterfield and, and you know, we, we just did a webinar. I know our friend David Olson's in here with us from Retro Report. Um, we just did a webinar last month about gerrymandering and redistricting, and, and every state right now is going through it. Rodney, I don't know if you taught civics. I know you taught history, but I don't know if you also, I know we've all taught everything. When you teach as long as Rodney and I do, you teach a little everything. But, you know, you could use this class with your U.S. history class in middle school or high school, and then you can turn around and use it with your civics class in middle school or your government or your AP at the high school, because there's just so many layers to pull it apart. And, and Rodney, I'm going to pick on you now um, because some of these topics that Hannah and Lance just talked about, you know, the lawsuit and the annexation, but then also um, the role of the public historians and, and the way that Joseph has been relentless in tracking down these stories. Um, and, you know, I'm looking at, I'm scanning through the chat here that Lillian's been helping us with and Mary. Um, we are living in a time when teachers are kind of being questioned and there are, you know, laws being passed and there are 
you know, people who are concerned about certain concepts being taught in schools. And I love how you started your conversation, Rodney, with putting these resources in the hands of people that know it best, which are the teachers. Because not only do they know the documents and they know the history, but they know their mm -hmm. students. And, and gifted teachers know how to bring this to life using rich resources like you. But what advice do you have, Rodney, for teachers who are feeling like, I'm, I'm not sure I can use this film or I can use these resources. I don't wanna get in trouble or I don't wanna you know, have a parent call and complain or I don't want an administrator to, you know, are, are there any thoughts that you have on that topic? Because I know a lot of teachers have you know, been concerned about this for the last few months. Um, so words of wisdom from you. Um, I mean, I don't know how th these are words of wisdom, but I'm always John Lewis. I'm gonna get into some good trouble. You know, <laughs> as as I move it, but the reality is, if I'm put, if I'm reading a primary source from the Richmond Times Dispatch in 1887, I mean, what do you have to say about that? You know, that's the local newspaper. What parents are gonna say? I don't want my kid reading the newspaper. You know, or if you find a letter written by a legislator, you know, they, these are primary sources. I think the argument today has sort of been like, let's find these boogeymen, let's find 1619 Project, let's go after abolitionist teaching, Bettina Love. And that's what today's gibberish is all about. But if you actually focus on primary sources, these are the sources from the day. What are you telling me I can't use the constitution? You can't tell me I can't use Virginia 1901 constitution in my classroom? You know, and so that's really what it's all about. And what the graphic organizers do is allows the students to look at it, interpret it, and form their own opinion. You know, and so if you're, I don't see many people stand up in a school board meeting and say, hey, my kid read a copy of the 1901 Virginia Constitution. I don't want to, you know, them teaching that rubbish. Really? You know, because the language was pretty clear back then on how they felt. So I just think we need to stick to prime. I'm just in general a primary source type of guy. I think you should stick to primary sources, you know, at all points in history. And I think if you do that, you can kind of avoid that boogeyman that's out there because the reality is no one knows the actual primary sources, but they know those key buzzwords. They know those key buzz people. And so if you bring in something of that nature, then they can jump on it. But like I said, just put the primary sources in the hands of students. And especially if it's something that mentioned in the curriculum, I mean, you're not going to get in trouble. There's ways around it. Just avoid the, the controversial titles, the controversial people. But I can take documents from 1619 and have students read them, but I'm not reading the 1619 project. You see what I'm saying? And so that, that's how you get around that. It's just use the primary sources, avoid the modern commentary. That be, and the reality is, Modern commentary, I think, does more harm to our students than good. You know, allow the students to critically think and analyze it on their own. So be brave, get the resources, and just don't walk into an argument. And you know the arguments that you're going to walk into. I know we're running a couple minutes over because we had some technical difficulties. The panelists don't mind staying a couple more minutes. Um, Mary, are there other questions from our audience? We want to make yes. sure we get to um, Yes, uh, Sam asked a question. Uh, he said, my eighth graders are in the process of making many documentaries about different monuments, memorials, and historical sites in Richmond. Um, and he said, I realize you you all didn't have a script. He's talking about Lance and Hannah. Um, but how did you go about organizing all of your information in a cohesive creation? Because the students are currently working on their scripts and would appreciate any advice that you have to offer. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, Sam. Um, I'll just say briefly, we, we definitely had an outline uh, and an ever evolving outline. And by that, I mean that as we conducted interviews, we responded to them. And so if we learned something in an interview, whether it was information that was new to us or it was information characterized in a new way, interpreted in a new way, we, we adjusted our, our outline accordingly. So we, we didn't, didn't for this project and, and for no other project have we kind of decided what the film would be and then gone out to find people to fill in those blanks. We have started with a vision and, and then gone and talked to people to learn 
what is the real story and and how can we uh, frame that real story within within that vision within the broad argument that we're trying to make but all the details come from the actual work that the interviewing the research uh, the sort of reporting of the story uh, and so we had an outline that uh, that we followed and that that we adjusted um, as we went along yeah and, and i'll say too that you know though this is a visual medium we actually do a lot of writing yeah um, and a lot of research in the form of um, both primary and secondary sources and often you know we need to really organize our own thoughts and and collect information from different sources and and put that on paper and you know we have pages and pages of google docs where it's just kind of mind dump of you know oh i learned this thing and this thing and then you kind of place those things in the outline that you're developing and that's evolving as you're doing your interviews and, and making sure that you're bringing all those pieces together. Um, but certainly writing is, is a critical part of the process. Okay. And, and I, I would just say, you know, with regard to making many pieces about the monument, about monuments, um, I think that that's, that's potentially really interesting. And, and I'm sure you're directing your students on it in, in an interesting way. I, I think the, the thing about monuments, whether it's here or anywhere in the world, right, they reflect the people who put them up and who maintain them and who, who make sure that they stay up. And so one thing that we didn't find any interest whatsoever in, in bringing into our film and, and talking about was like, who sculpted that monument? And, you know, what was the, the kind of uh, sort of art, um, you know, movement that it was, you know, responding to or how did how what were its aesthetics to me to us that just wasn't interesting. What was much more interesting was why was it put up in the first place and and who kept it up and why were people against it and 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 what language did they use and, and how did that align with various sort of, you know, political uh, uh, histories that, that were ongoing, you know, always kind of zooming out from the monument and looking down from the pedestal to the people below that that to me is what's most interesting about monuments is is the people and the ideas that swirl around them um, much more than the than the stone yeah one of the one of the uh articles that's in that bunk exhibit talks about the power of empty pedestals and working with some students in richmond this past fall um kids were talking about what's going to happen to these empty pedestals and so talking about you know how it, it really does change the the physical landscape and and rodney you may have to write an addendum to your resources we may have to add a few more um learning resources on later i know that that's a, a big topic of discussion with teachers is what what do we do next like is monument avenue still monument avenue when there are no mon monuments left but i keep reminding them there is a monument left and that's arthur ash so that's a whole other discussion um other questions, Mary? I know we, we've got a couple more minutes and then I will let folks go. And I just wanna say, if you think of questions later on, Lillian's gonna put my email in the chat for you. Um, and it's perfectly great. If you have a great question or, or a student, you know, if something comes up, email it to me and I can hunt uh, Rodney down and, and Hannah and Lance and try and get an answer for you afterwards. But Mary, are there any other questions waiting? Uh, yes, one just popped up. Okay. Um, Martina asked, um, let's see if you've already answered this, but has your documentary gone off to be picked up by any streaming services? And if so, could you tell us how an individual gets to have an opportunity to have their own documentary picked up by any um, streaming service? If not, a better question would be, how do you get your documentary to have a chance to pick up traction i.e. how do you get documentaries shown in venues? I, that um, in many ways is the million dollar question. And, and I think the answer to it is both specific to each project and always changing. I think the best answer that I can offer is a very brief one, which is partnerships. Um, you're never gonna be able to do it on your own. And uh, no matter how big or small the film, if it's had an impact, it had a lot of people involved in it. And that's not only people behind the scenes helping to make the film, which are, which are critical, but it's it's people like Mary at VPM and and Annie at New American History and Rodney. It's, it's, it's so many partnerships that can elevate the work and elevate the vision if it's worth elevating. Um, that's how you do it. You don't do it on your own. Yeah, and our main goal was to make sure that this film was available to Richmond, to teachers, and 
for all those folks freely streamable. So we didn't want it to have to be, you know, you have to remember your eighth password for a streaming service. Now that, I mean, there's plenty of great stuff on streaming services, but, you know, for this, be, and, you know, in part, we we're able to do that through the partnership with VPM um, that, you know, that this film was fully funded by them. And so we didn't need to worry about anything except let's just get it out there and make it super accessible. Um, and streaming services, yeah, it, it is, it's a tricky landscape and it's, it's a really one where you have to know people. Um, but, you know, Lance, like Lance is saying, it's, it's great to start with, um, you know, your local PBS station, your local partnerships with um, school systems, and you can, you know, maybe not get uh, as big of an audience as, as you might like, but sometimes it's more important to have a targeted audience and make sure you're really getting the film seen by people who can put it to work and, and gain a lot from it. And another way to do that is to make films that people actually need. You know, several years ago, we made a documentary about the history and the legacy of lynching in the American South. We had the opportunity to tour that film to 80 sites in 30 states, uh, screening it for small and large groups, thousands and thousands of people. Um, we think it was a good, worthy film, but I think another reason that it drew so much interest all over the country again and again and again was because nobody had a teachable size piece of media about the history of lynching. This was a 33 minute film, something that could be screened in a class or assigned as homework. It was designed as such. We worked with the Southern Poverty Law Center to create a curriculum guide around that. These were things that didn't exist. And so people, teachers were, were keen to, to bring that into their classroom, to, to see the film, to think about how to work with it. Um, a critical aspect of that is that um, it, it was filling a gap. And so I think that that's another way to make sure that your work actually reaches an audience is that you're, you're creating something that, that needs to be out there. Yeah, that, that's actually how I first became aware of your work was you showed uh, the film and outrage at the state social studies conference and did a, and did a panel at that time. Rodney, I don't know if you had already discovered Field Studio before that or, but that was my first time becoming aware of their work was at the social studies conference here in Virginia. Um, so. And then, of course, the future of America's past. We've been writing learning resources to go along with that series on PBS. And um, when you mentioned Fort Monroe, Rodney, and you mentioned John Lewis, we have we developed learning resources based on the um, Freedom's Fortress, uh, which was the the premiere episode of the Future of America's Past. We have one on John Lewis um, that is based on the primary source, which was the letter that he left and asked to be released after he passed away. Um, and so embedding sources, but like you said, uh, Hannah and Lance, these are things that teachers needed desperately, but we didn't have great resources okay. for. Um, and so that's why when someone like Rodney comes along and develops resources, not just one, but multiple at multiple grade levels and multiple ability levels. Um, and I know that we are running out of time. And Mary, if there are any more questions in the Q&A? No, there, okay. there are not. Okay, I just want to. If I can just emphasize one thing that, that yes, Rodney. Please. If I can just emphasize one thing that Rodney said that I think is, is really critical. Um, he, he, in responding to a question about kind of like how can teachers teach a good, full, and truthful history without getting in trouble with people, and, and he referred to you know making sure to just you know touch on things that are in the curriculum. I think one of the most powerful parts of the curriculum guide for this film that Rodney created are the several pages where he aligns it to the Virginia standards of learning and the common core state standards. I think that's powerful because it demonstrates that this curriculum is not another thing to teach, but it's another way to teach things that you already are required to teach. Yeah. Um, and teachers have too much to do already. They have too much to, to teach. They, they have too many other uh, problems that, that, that they're expected to, to deal with. We ask teachers to be social workers and world movers and oh, it'd be nice if you taught something also and do it with a smile. Uh, teachers are asked to do way too much. And that's why I think those, those pages where Rodney ties the film and, the, and the, the activities in the curriculum guide to the standards that already exist, the teachers are already being assessed on, that's crucial. That is what demonstrates that this is actually something you can work with. It's not just like nice to add it on top. Absolutely. Rodney, I'm gonna give you the last word. Is there anything that I haven't asked you or that other people who have spoken to you about these wonderful resources, is there a question you wish somebody would ask you? 
I'm gonna. That's get not a question. I wish it's just sometimes just be prepared to go on the the resource hunt, you know, because as a teacher, you get this one resource and like, ooh, that reminds me of something I looked at some years ago that would fit into this, that would do this. And then next thing you know, you're on the resource hunt, but at the same time, it's that labor. You love doing that because it's for your students. Like just an example, we're talking about Curtis Hulk. You know, I was like reading about him, you know, in the annexation. And that took me down a rabbit hole. Next thing you know, I'm developing a professional development for teachers on the annexation and how that got, you know, Richmond out of line with the Brown versus board ruling and how that led to a whole nother set of issues talking about the history of education in the city of Richmond. So that's the great thing about it. You never know where you're going to end up when you go down this resource hole as a teacher. And, you know, you'll find that one spark. Next thing you know, you created something totally different. And that was the entire point of this. I want to spark that creativity that's missing in teachers. So often we get these curriculums, we get these guides, we get all this information, but we don't get the ability to just create something ourselves. And this film and this curriculum is there to inspire you to get creative, to get back into the things you love, get back to being a historian. Cause that's the reason we're all history teachers as well. Cause we're historians and we wanna make our students historians. So just get back into the history of it and enjoy it. Well, thank you so much. We loved having you guys here. We loved our participants in the chat uh, tuning in. We love teachers, obviously. Um, Rodney, thank you for making these resources. And Hannah and Lance, thank you for making this film and more importantly, making it so accessible. Um, I want to thank Mary and Lillian. Lillian has been kind enough to drop a very quick two question survey into the chat. If you have a moment, uh, to take that survey. It just gives us feedback and also a way to follow up with you if you had more specific questions we didn't have time to answer or if you think of something later on. Um, and we will be posting this on our YouTube channel for New American History. So if uh, you know, a few people had trouble logging in at the beginning or there were other things going on this evening, um, and I hope this will be the first of many conversations. We love working with everyone that's, who's on this panel, and I know that our paths will cross again, but um, in particular, we want to thank our filmmakers and thank Rodney. So Hannah and Lance and Rodney, thank you for the, your beautiful film and your beautiful resources, but more importantly, thank you for supporting teachers. So with that, I will say goodnight to all of our friends in the chat. Thank you for joining us and um, have a great um, rest of your evening. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you.